So I'd say it's obvious that the real world impact of too little independence and free play is too much, you know, anxiety and depression. Hello and welcome back to the Hannah Franklin Podcast. On today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking to a woman who was once branded as America's worst mom for letting her nine-year-old ride the subway by himself in New York City. Lenore Skenazy is the founder of Free Range Kids, and she co-founded an organization called Let Grow with Jonathan Haidt and Dr. Peter Gray. And in today's episode, Lenore and I talk about her work advocating for independence in kids and what happened in America that caused us to go from being a culture where it was totally normal for kids to walk to school by themselves and go play at the park by themselves to a culture where if you let your kids walk down the street alone, you might have child protective services called on you. We talk about what happened, we talk about why, and we talk about the developmental implications of overprotecting our kids from the world and not allowing them to grapple with their own limitations and their own sense of confidence and competence navigating the world around them. Lenora was so fun to talk to, and I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Lenora, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here, Hannah, which is my sister's name, too. I love the name Hannah. I'm, I'm so excited to have you here. I don't know where I first encountered the term free range kids. I don't know. I feel like I entered the alternative education world in like the mid 2010s. And it was a thing that people were it was just like part of the lexicon. People were just using it. I assume it originated <laughs> with you because you started your blog back in the early 2000s, 2000, right? Uh, 2008, I think. Or, or, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in yeah. 2008, I I was a free range kid. I was busy being <laughs> homeschooled on a dirt road in Pennsylvania, spending most of my time oh outside. My God, and so when I heard people talking about this. Grown ups now. That's so disturbing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, 2008, I would have been. Oh, tell me 20. I? <laughs> um, I feel like that would have been when I, about like when I entered middle school. Okay. So I wasn't a little baby. Um, mm-hmm. But this idea of free range kids was very intuitive to me because I grew up in it. But it also was such a pervasive idea in the education world, the alternative education world at large. I feel like it's you you hit on one of those very intuitive nerves where people are just like, oh, yes, this this makes sense. We want our free range eggs and our free range beef okay. and our free range kids. Um, is that where the term started? Was it your blog? Uh, I, I trademarked free range kids. So I, you know, I'm, I can take credit, but I also can't take credit. People say, oh, that's what I always called myself or my kids. So I think it was out there. I sort of claimed it, but I didn't invent it. You've been an amazing face for it though, because I don't, I don't know how many conversations I've had with people who are talking about letting their kids take more risks or, you know, letting their kids walk home from school alone or letting them play outside unsupervised. And I'm like, well, have you read Lenora's blog? And everyone to a T says, yes, I, oh. I love her work. Oh, so um, it's And so it's very exciting to actually have you on the podcast because I've been one of those readers for a long time too. And I want to I wanna dig into, there's a couple different pieces of the work that you do that I think are going to be really good for us to delve into, especially as they pertain to other conversations that I've had here on the show about kids taking risks and kind of like finding that line between you know, letting your kids develop the way that they want to, but also, you know, not, not, them. not taking risks. That, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, that line. I mean, maybe, maybe we start there. Like on a very high level, you are such an eloquent advocate for the importance of letting kids take risks and letting them push their own boundaries and test themselves against the world. And it's a thing that, but, but you're not, well, it's a thing that, you know, so many people are afraid of, but it's also, you're not haphazardly advocating for this. Like yeah, there's a, I, there's a balance between the value of safety and the value of risk taking. And I don't know, I'm curious how you articulate the balance between the two. Cause I think that's an important starting point for the conversation that we're going to have. I think it is the conversation that people have to have with each other or with themselves because. 
I don't think there is a a balance. I think the minute you're saying they could be safe and um, that'd be fine, you know, maybe a little boring, or they could have risks and adventures, but maybe die, you're going to (laughs) lose. There's there's nothing that wins in a battle against or your kid could die. And so I think the real thing to think about is how come we're always putting these things on a on a scale and then once you put them on the scale, any freedom has lost because you could just, I mean, it's like, you know, you think it's good for them to get fresh air. It's good for them to have adventures or good for them to fail sometimes. But what if they die? And it's like, well, maybe it's not that important. And it really isn't. I, the reason I started the Free Range Kids blog after having let my son ride the subway by himself at age nine, which was the inciting incident, was to say, I love safety, right? I love helmets and car seats and seat belts and mouth guards and uh, vaccines and d- the many layers of clothing. I mean, I, I feel like I'm very cautious. Um, so I don't think you have to be un- unheedful of danger uh, before you let your kids do something. I The weird thing is when my mom let me walk to school, and I think when your mom was letting you play outside, it wasn't like she was calculating all the time, you know, does this, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And the is it worth it part is new and it feels innate. And so if we could just like talk about that for an hour, it's like, how did this become to feeling like, of you know, so many people say to me, you know, I, 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 I started cutting them out. I just cut out one yesterday um, that like, I'd like to let her do and then fill in the blank, you know, walk to school, wait for the bus alone, play outside, go to the park, but I could never forgive myself if, and then the if is always, basically when somebody kills her, (laughs) whether it's a car or a stranger. And my mom, who was a nervous mom who quit her job to stay home with me and my sister, let us walk to school starting at age five. And you'd go around the corner and she wouldn't hear from us until we came home at 3.30. And so somehow there was an ability to tolerate not knowing how your kid is and not going to the very darkest point every single second of the day or nobody would have done it. And now nobody does do it. So that's what's changed in our culture. This worst first thinking that takes over our brains that feels like, oh, well, everybody wants their kid to be safe. So so I do too. It's like, we all want our kids to be safe, but we never thought that safety meant constant supervision because the alternative was constant danger. That is a big part of what I want to talk about because I find the evolution of this so fascinating. I think to combat it, you have to understand how it happened because I feel it in the culture and it's a thing that I have to consciously work against in my own psychology as a kid who grew up playing outside and grew up I was homeschooled my whole my whole childhood. I was not a pro- product of the system. We didn't watch TV. Like I wasn't even steeped in the culture everyone else was steeped in. And yet it's still so pervasive, this idea of, but what if somebody kidnaps my kid? What if? Or what if my kid falls and gets hurt and dies alone and <laughs> I'm not there to take care of them? And if From I've the only scrape. just been there with them, I couldn't save them. I'm so happy you're, you're articulating all of this because- What you're saying is exactly that. You've gone from, you know, what if my kid is playing outside to what if my kid is dying a slow, painful, lonely death in the dark with nobody there but the rats, you know, that's, that's, I mean, if you were a psychiatrist, you hearing that story, you might go like, let us talk about this. Why are you doing this? But of course, if everyone in an entire culture is going there, I, I gave a talk last week, maybe it's two weeks ago now, um, And at one point in my talk, I generally ask parents, you know, like, what did you love doing as a kid that you don't let your own kids do? And it just explodes in conversation and people are laughing and crying. And, and one of the people at the, at at the talk was a grandma and she just sort of monopolized things for a while, telling us all the fun stories about blah, 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 her childhood. Right. Then afterwards, she came up to me and interrupted a conversation I was having with an actual psychiatrist, which was really fun, but too bad. Up she came and she said she was with her nine-year-old granddaughter recently. And um, she wanted to let her cross the street, but then she thought, no, no. And she thought better of it, which I think is worse of it, which is that, you know, she said, and she said those exact words, I could never forgive myself if, and I was like, you're doing it. And she said, doing what? I said, you're doing what my whole lecture was about, (laughs) like how we go to this dark point. But it's, it is so ingrained in the culture that people don't recognize it. And 
Um, one of the ways I know you're interested in sort of the evolution of this. One of the ways I think it got evolved is, you know, we always blame the media and I blame the media too. And it's, it's immediate and it takes stories from different eras and different parts of the country and take mixes up fact and fiction. And it's always the worst case scenario because that gets people excited enough to watch. And media's job is not to inform you. It's to pull you in to the point where you can count as a consumer and be, you know, handed off to the advertiser, the more eyeballs, the more money. But eras get different stories that become the story of their time. I'm, I'm reading a book that's set um, just after um, World War II. And all the characters there are very concerned about like who has a gold star in their window, who got a bronze heart. I mean, at that point, it was all about what did you do in the war? How brave were you? What, you know, where were you stationed? And that was, uh, you know, an understandable obsession uh, with American culture let's say in 1950s. Uh, more recently, the story that we've become addicted to is of a child who was unsupervised and met their doom. <laughs> and you know that that has become the story of the time because there was a study done where they showed people a picture of an anchor man, you know, sitting there with the news that he's about to read. And behind him was a picture of a playground. And they asked, I don't know how many people, what do you think this story is? And most of them said, guess what? It's, I think it's a picture of a, an empty swing at the playground. What is this story? I assume a child got kidnapped or murdered at the playground. <laughs> yeah, everybody does. And so would I. I mean, it was a fake thing, so there was no story. But, but the point is that, you know, you don't think, oh, they're building a new playground in, you know, downtown. Or, oh, you know, this, this, somebody on the playground found a $100 bill. It's, it's always that story. And the way I've seen it um, in my own life is that after I let my son ride the subway by his by himself and wrote a column about it. I was on all these talk shows. And at some point in, in all of the conversations, the, 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 the interviewer would grow very somber and say, okay, you know, he had a great time, was wonderful, blah, blah, blah. But how would you have felt if he never came home? And um, I, I, I flubbed this question for about four years until I realized, why are they, it's not a question, <laughs> you know, they know how I'd feel. So why are they asking? They were asking to get the story back on track. My son had done something by himself. He was fine. Okay, now let's get it back to the story everybody wants to hear. Mom took her eyes off the kid and something bad didn't happen, but it could have. It's like almost as good a story. And we've suddenly gone from a story of triumph to a story of near death, right? It wasn't death. And and the way you know that this is happening, not just when people do weird things like let their kid ride the subway, is every year some kid gets off at the wrong bus stop at the beginning of the year. And people send me the stories when they show up on TV. Why is this a television story? But it is because they interview the mom who said, I'm just so grateful that he walked the extra three blocks and got home safely. And then they interview, you know, this could have been a very tragic accident. And then the kid is like, you know, staring wide eyed, like, really? It was that big a deal? Um, but once again, it has been turned into instead of a kid bravely figuring out where he was or having some kind of tearful, scary, unhappy time. There is my mom. I can't figure it out. And then figuring it out, which are stories of how kids act in real life, which is they go through some times that are scary. They go through some confusion and some bad stuff, but it's not the worst stuff. Right. And that's how they realize like, hey, I can get home instead of firing the bus company and, you know, and uh, drawn and quartering the, the bus driver who let the kid off at the wrong stop. It always becomes a tale of um, just very lucky that he got home safely. And then you framed it like, well, that you mean that most kids who get off the bus stop don't get home safely? And, and so you wonder, how do we end up so scared? We're constantly told that any time a child is unsupervised, they are in grave danger and no decent parent would put their child in grave danger. So therefore, no decent parent takes their eyes off their kids. I mean... It makes sense that the media has and like the cultural story has devolved to this because we're so addicted to the terrible stories on, on so many levels. Like it's on a in a very perverse way. It's a horrible sort of entertainment. Oh, it but it's also like we we gravitate towards the things that we're afraid of psychologically because they're warning stories to make sure this horrible thing, unimaginable thing never happens to us. Mm -hmm. And it just gets preyed upon and like, you know, what's more important than our kids, right? It makes sense that the culture has gone there, but it's also, it's such a toxic way of thinking. Like imagine, it feels like a parallel to me to like, imagine you talked about, you went on all these news shows after you published this piece about letting your kid ride the subway. 
imagine if every time you finished your interview, somebody said, oh, my goodness, you could have had stage fright. You could have <laughs> accidentally sworn on camera. Yeah, really. You could have you said the wrong thing. Stain. You could have, you could have accidentally doxed yourself. <laughs> right. Yes. And like, imagine if that's how you were greeted every time you got off the news, you probably yeah. wouldn't have wanted to do the news anymore because every time you'd go on, you'd be really scared. Like, uh, what if they're right? Like, what if what if I do get terrible stage fright and faint on camera? Like you start to think that that's a likely scenario because that's the first thing everyone thinks about whenever they hear that you are on TV. But in reality, like, yeah, once in a while, somebody gets on camera and they get really scared and it doesn't go well. But most of the time, people are fine. And right. no one expects and often there's an editor that <laughs> who can snip that part yes, out. Right. And no one expects no one expects that something terrible is going to happen to you. But like, imagine if you spent your whole life thinking about that whenever you did something. Like you, you'd never succeed at anything. Well, imagine if you thought that every time you were about to drive your kids somewhere, you know, I know it's mm -hmm. probably going to be fine, but I would never forgive myself if a drunk driver came up or what if I am talking and I missed the stop sign and then I get T-boned and then he's in a wheelchair and it's all my fault. We don't do that. So there's something also selective about what we've decided to be afraid of. And, and what I said before is true. It's a child that's unattended. Right. So if you're with the kid, it's not your fault. You know, you did your best. You were with them. You put them in a seatbelt or a car seat. You did what you could. But actually, the number one way kids die is as car passengers. And frankly, I do have a terror of cars. I mean, I get in them. But what can you do? I mean, we I feel like my fear is out of out of whack. Um, out of proportion with the reality, and yet more, more sane than the fear of a kid standing outside with, you know, playing uh, tennis against the wall. But I think there's also like, if you're there, there's sort of this sense that maybe there's something you can do, as opposed to the dark unknown of your child being alone, and you can't even you're not even conscious of what's happening. And so you can't stop it. I think in the same way that like people are more afraid of flying on an airplane than they are right. driving in a car, even though they're more Maybe. likely to die in the car. It's like, But <laughs> the I'm, in the, I'm in the driver's seat. Like, right. I'm I'm in control as opposed to just being a passenger and there's literally nothing you can do if the plane starts having a problem. Yeah, no, control is um, actually, throughout the word control on this little note to talk to you about. Um, <laughs> so, so there's an interesting idea about control, which is that actually when things are going pretty well in your life, you assume that it's thanks to you. You know, you, you got that good job or you were smart enough to move to that neighborhood or you picked a good spouse, whatever it is. You feel like it's thanks to you and it's people whose lives are more chaotic um, and, you know, harder that realize how much is luck and how much is uh, out of our control. And the, you know, that's not great. Um, but neither is great the idea that you are in total control because that leaves you no wiggle room at all. If you are in total control of everything that happens to your kid, if they don't get into Harvard, that's because you didn't sign them up for travel hockey, you know, and if they get hurt, once again, it's because of you, right? You weren't paying enough attention. You did something wrong. And the, the more control you think you have, the more crazy you're going to drive yourself. Because that means, I mean, it starts with, there's, a, there's this thing called the owlet, which is just a, it's like an electronic sock that you put on your baby, your healthy baby, when they come home um, uh, from the hospital after you've had them. And, um, and it registers their their heart rate and their something else, their temperature and how much they're moving. And then it registers their blood oxygen level. And the original website for the owlet, uh, put it this way, just because their little chest is moving up and down doesn't mean they're getting enough oxygen. And what I, what I love about that is like, you wonder why parents are so crazy today because they're told that they're sleeping, they're healthy, sleeping, newborn, in a crib with their, with their chest going up and down is still in grave danger and they better be paying more attention because if not, they might not be getting enough oxygen. So if it starts out the first night you've had your kid home and you're already being told that you can't even sleep when they're asleep because something bad could be happening, you're priming the pump for terror all along. And so that that device and all the tracking devices that are out there now, including all the ones that are school portals that I'm, I'm sure your listeners hate and have possibly quit school because of, that tell you the grades immediately on a, you know, on a Spanish test. And sometimes they tell you their behavior today, you know, was it a green light, a red light, or a yellow light? Um, that presumes that you must know absolutely everything and that you can control for it if you know it all. And 
To me, that drives me crazy two ways. One is it's omniscience without omnipotence, right? You know what they're, you know, they had a bad day, but you weren't there, you know, you couldn't fix it. And then it's also, um, if something does go wrong, it's your fault. And that, that is another layer of fear, right? Not just that something bad will happen, but something bad will happen. And it's like, well, why weren't you there? Why weren't you watching? Why didn't you tune in? Why weren't you tracking? What about an air tag? You know? And so the minute you think that you can control everything, there's, there's a giant pressure on you. And then there's no grace if anything goes wrong, because it was all on you and something bad happened. You failed. I want to go back. There are two pieces of this that I want to dig into further. First, I want to talk about the, I think, emotional pushback that parents feel to what you're saying, because they're not wrong that their child getting to play outside today is not worth their child dying right. for the right to play right, outside today. Like they're, they're not incorrect about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're just incorrectly calculating the risk. It's not incorrectly calculating risk. It's, it's thinking that you can calculate risk and, and immediately putting every childhood activity into an equation, right? Is this, does this outweigh that? First of all, you don't know. Secondly, you're not in control. You know, the kid could be playing inside and a meteor comes through the roof. I was just at the Field Museum of Natural History. It showed a meteor that had come through somebody's roof, you know, so... Um, once you start deciding that if you're really smart and you're really good at calculus, you can figure out exactly what the odds are and then make your decision based on that, you've lost. Because as we said earlier, anytime that the other choice is your kid could die, you know, you're going to say no to any activity. But it's, it's, this, it's this view of risk versus no risk. First of all, there's nothing that's no risk. And secondly, I don't think I don't think our job is to just decide what's the less risky option in every childhood circumstance. And, and somehow that has become our job, I think, in, in part because we look so much to science and the latest studies to tell us, you know, if you breastfeed for nine months, it, you get different results than if you breastfeed for eight and a half months. And like, oh, well, I better do nine months. So everything has become sort of um, scientific or pseudoscientific to the point where instead of thinking that, go have fun, hon, or remember, don't run into the street, don't go off with a stranger, you're not allowed to say that anymore. You have to go through an enormous checklist of dangers and probabilities before you make a decision, and then you're, you're always going to decide, forget it, it's not safe enough. But how do you, like if a parent, I mean... I agree with everything that you're saying, but I'm going to play devil's advocate no, for that's a second. Okay. Let's, let's figure it out. Yeah. Parent, yeah. This impulse in a parent to protect their child is very strong. Like I am not yet a parent. Even when I am around the, the children of people I care about, my instinct to protect the child is very strong. Like it's, it's hardwired in us to take care of kids. That's true. Yeah. And so the thought of something possibly hurting a child and when, when you've been bombarded by that yeah, possibility. Right. For so long. Mm -hmm. And so you can't help but see it. You think of your kid walking right. half a mile to their friend's house unsupervised. And it's like, well, any rando having a bad day could just like <laughs> stop along the side of the street and pick them up. Like as randos do whenever they have a bad day. <laughs> I've had such a bad day. What can I do? I can get ice cream or I could adopt a kid. Yeah, that sounds good. So <laughs> so I agree. I agree that it feels innate. Um but mm -hmm. I don't think it's innate. And because I don't think it's innate. I agree. Wait, wait, wait. Just like any other psychological problem that feels innate, I must line up my pencils, right? I must make my bed, right? If I don't do that, you know, I'll be struck dead. That feels innate too. It's, it's uh, you know, obsessive compulsion disorder is the idea that if you don't do something, you, you can jump in, but then I'm going to go through my analogy. So jump in. Well, I was just, I know I, I like your analogy. The only pushback is that Someone who's suffering from OCD is not going to stop lining up their pencils just because someone says, right. you know, you're not going to get in a car accident today if your pencils are crooked. Right. Um, by the way, you will get in a car accident. So there's like Remember, this we discussed this already. Cars are very dangerous. Don't get in a car. Um, so, <laughs> so here's the deal, right? Even the pencils are not going to save you, right? Um, get, a, yeah. get a new model with uh, really good brakes. Um, so I agree. I, I agree that... Um, listening to a podcast of a woman who's already been called America's worst mom is probably not going to convince anybody. So the thing is that 
I recognize that. And so, so we've established that in 2008, I wrote uh, eight, I wrote this column. I got the blog Free Range Kids going. I wrote the book Free Range Kids. And for 10 years, I went around the country talking about how we got so afraid for our kids, sort of like this. Um, mm -hmm. And for 10 years, I would see everybody nodding along and going, oh, yes. And oh, I remember my childhood. Oh, we stayed out till the streetlights came on. Oh, my God. My parents never knew where I was because there weren't cell phones. Incredible. I can't believe it. And then nothing would change because you can't be the only person going home and saying like, that woman was right. <laughs> I'm going to send my kid half a mile to the park where there's nobody to play with because everybody else is, you know, at travel soccer or on TikTok. And then they're going to have a great time and they're going to come home and I'm going to be the only one. That, that doesn't work. So it's a collective problem because as we've established, my mom didn't think this way and now it's normal to think this way. It feels, it feels innate. And I say it's not innate because my mom didn't feel that way. So obviously there's some tension between what feels innate and what is innate. So how do you change behavior? That's what, when we, when we founded Let Grow, which is me, Peter Gray, who I would guess that a lot of your listeners know, he wrote Free to Learn. He really believes in self-directed education and the value of mixed age free play. Um, Dan Shuckman, who used to be the chairman of FIRE, which fights for free speech on campus, and Jonathan Haidt, who everyone thinks is Jonathan Haidt, um, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind. And he has another big book coming out called The Anxious Generation that I helped write three chapters of. Um, so, so all of us together are keenly aware that um, parents are really scared today. We don't blame parents because there's this culture that, you know, it's not a crazy parent if every parent is feeling this way. It's not some neurotic lady. It's a culture. So a collective problem needs a collective solution, and it has to be behavior. Because I saw for myself 10 years, thinking about something didn't change behavior. But if you can change a parent's behavior, that not only changes their behavior, it also changes their thinking. And in fact, that's what cognitive behavioral therapy does. And so the, the only solution that I've found in all these years, and I'm open to any other solutions <laughs> anybody else comes up with. But this one was not even mine. I, I steal all my ideas. This was from a woman named Joanna Drusen, sixth grade teacher in Manhattan, long time ago, read about the, the subway ride and decided to have her sixth graders do something else on their own, something that they felt ready for. Just like my son Izzy felt ready for the subway ride and I let him. And so she sent them home with this homework assignment that says, go home and do something new that you're ready for, that for some reason or not, you haven't done yet. And you have to get your parents' permission, but you don't do it with your parents. And then she called me in to see what they had done. And I sat there for, you know, she was a, the, the social studies teacher. So she had six classes during the day of like 20 or 30 kids each. And so I heard thing after thing after thing. I made scrambled eggs. I took my dog to the vet. I walked to soccer by myself. Some kids actually took the subway. And um, that's what eventually became what we call the Let Grow Project which we recommend that homeschoolers or in-schoolers or whatever you want to, whoever you are, we recommend that you give kids the homework assignment that says, go home and do something new on your own with, you know, without your parents. You can do it with a friend. And we have a list of things that's, you know, walk the dog, run an errand. But of course, the list is infinite and it depends on the kid and the age and the neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. But when the parent is pushed to let go of their kid because it works, you know, I have to say it works pretty well in schools because <laughs> there's a lot of kids doing it at once, but maybe homeschooler groups could do this too. When all the parents are doing this and all the kids are doing this, you're not the crazy parent. The kid has to do it. It's something that, you know, the group or the school has agreed on. And you're talking amongst yourselves and the kids are talking amongst yourselves. And so it's, it's going to happen. And then when the kid does go and they come back and they went to the store and they got the correct change and they came home with, I've seen this, with the gallon of juice or anything or a candy bar or they met a dog, whatever it is, you're flooded with this shock and joy of seeing that your kid is competent and your kid is part of the world and your kid can do something that you didn't realize yet. And that is such a brain rewiring experience that that's the only thing that's going to change parents, not thinking about it, not dithering, not reading another book, not, you know, looking at actuarial tables. You have to let your kid do something on their own and then experience the joy that our culture has, has taken from parents which is the joy of recognizing like, hey, I must have done a pretty good job. Or my God, my kid got lost 
and it was an extra half hour and I was going crazy. But then she came home and she said, mom, I was so confused. I went to the picket fence, but it's the wrong fence. And now I came home and it's like, and now here I am. Even that's great in a way that's better because they realize they can even deal with some fear or frustration or confusion and get themselves out of that. And do that a couple times and things start seeming much less scary. You're not making that equation all the time. I could let her go outside or she could die. It's like, of course, go outside. Oh my God, I forgot the napkins. Will you go get the napkins? You know, go to the 7-Eleven. So the only thing I've seen that changes parents, um, I would say sort of dark thought rail, you know, from freedom to death is intercepting it with from freedom to joy. And over and over again, and then it just becomes normal. And we we don't let kids do that, and we don't let parents do that, so they have no idea that that's on the other side. Today's episode is brought to you by the John Galt Mortgage Company. I promised myself when I started the show that I was never going to have a sponsor unless I could truly endorse what they are doing. And that could not be more true for the John Galt Mortgage Company. My friends, Mitch and Tim, started the company earlier this year after working in the real estate world for years and realizing that mortgages are way more expensive than they need to be. Most real estate agents don't actually know how much extra profit is baked into the cost of a mortgage. So Mitch and Tim started a new kind of mortgage, one where they cap their own profits on every transaction and pass the savings along to you, the buyer, in the form of a lower interest rate. If you are in the market for a house, I absolutely recommend checking out what Mitch and Tim are doing. You can find more at www.johngaltmortgage.com or you can find the link below in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. Do you feel like there's benefit in encouraging parents to start smaller with the types of things that they're letting their kids do, like doing things that would seem scary, like working with a hot stove or a sharp knife, but still inside the house, like the parents not helping, but the parents there, the kids not, you know, halfway across town and accidentally takes a wrong turn and ends up in the bad neighborhood or whatever. Like, does that help parents? Like, is that an easier pill for them to swallow? Have you noticed patterns like that where once they see their kids successfully making grilled cheese for themselves, they feel a little bit more comfortable letting them take the dog for a walk by themselves? Like, is there sort of a learning curve psychologically for parents that seems to be a consistent trend? Uh, We have a lot of internal discussions about that. And I'm hoping that someday there will actually be a study done because (laughs) sometimes when kids do their let grow it's called the let grow experience now. And once a month there, you know, do something with your, you know, for your family or do something for your community or do something outside or whatever. Some of the things have appalled me. They are so tiny. Um, I made a sandwich. I folded a towel. And, and then I talked to my fellow let growians who say, quit being a jerk, Lenore. (laughs) That was a big deal for them. Right. I mean, you know, they'd never folded a towel and that is an adult thing. And it's like, okay, so long as it's one of many things, I've come to believe that it's not terrible to take these tiny steps. Originally, I thought, who's going to get anywhere? You, you, you folded a towel, you've cleaned up your room, you toasted some bread, and now where are you? But I was just at a school that um, assigned the Let Grow experience to kids K through five. And one of the kids made literally made a sandwich, okay? Uh, he's a third grader. And I thought, my God, third grade, that's like eight. How can you not know how to make a sandwich? It's like not knowing how to walk, you know? I mean, it's like there aren't a lot of components, right? Um, and two <laughs> of them are the same. <laughs> so, uh, but on his little, that you, you fill out a leaf, a, a flat piece of paper that looks like a leaf that says, I made a sandwich. And underneath he wrote, I actually have it here somewhere on my desk, but he wrote something like, um, uh, now I know I can help myself if I'm hungry. And I thought, well, that is something. And I ended up talking to the people who run the school and that kid had been particularly like insanely pampered. And, you know, all we, we one of our expressions that let grow is always helping kids is hurting them. And I'd say that was a case of like, to not know how to feed yourself when you're hungry is, is a deficit, but now deficit no more. So, and then another one of the kids had, uh, taken the elevator down in his doorman building, remember I live in New York City, um, to to throw the trash out in the alley. And 
And I've, okay, taken, you know, taken an elevator. It's pretty safe. You can't go really in the wrong direction. <laughs> I guess you could go vertically wrong direction for a little bit, but eventually you're going to get to the bottom, right? And then you're going to just be able to take your garbage out, which is next to the building. So, but he said, his little statement after that is, now I know I'm, um, I can be fine when I'm alone. And, and I talked to a psychologist that I'm going to tell you about in a minute, who said, this is exactly what we look for in psychology. I'm like, garbage? He said, no, no, no. What, what it, it's called generalizing, right? <laughs> he went from, not, he didn't say, now I know I can be alone, fine when I'm alone in an elevator. He said, now I know I can be fine when I'm alone. So sometimes these little things that I used to scorn, that I'm trying to be open-minded about, um, end up being, first of all, bigger than I thought. And also, if you are talking about a kid who is so overprotected or underestimated that they never made a sandwich by themselves, maybe they have to start small. That being said, the, uh, there's a psychologist I love uh, named Camilo Ortiz. He's a professor at Long Island University. And uh, he did the first pilot study of using independence as therapy for anxiety. And that is he recruited um, four families and uh, each of whom had a child with serious anxiety, serious enough to be diagnosable. And he gave them a series of five sessions. The first session was just him meeting with the parents to discuss, you know, why are you here? What's, what's happening with your kid? And I'll just give you an example of one kid who was 10. He wouldn't go upstairs or downstairs in his own um, house. And I've heard about this so many times, not just about that one kid, but it seems to be common, or at least common enough that I've heard about it four or five times. Uh, anyways, and so the, he meets with the parents, he finds this out, he, he shows them a video about how great independence is, and he talks about independence, 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 he sends them home. Next time they come in with the kid. And, and if it were cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what this professor, who's also a psychologist, Camilo Ortiz, normally does, he would say something like, well, I hear you're afraid to go upstairs in your house without your parents. How about tonight you go up for five minutes? You know, we'll set a clock, you'll set a watch timer. And after five minutes, you can come down. And that's exposure therapy, right? You're exposed to the thing that you're afraid of and you realize, oh, that wasn't so bad. But this time he did something that he considers radically different, which is instead of talking about what the kid was afraid of or couldn't do, he said, you're 10. I've been talking to your parents about how important independence is. And I bet there's a lot of stuff that you're ready to do that you haven't done yet that you would like to do on your own. Are there some things? Let's make a big list. And he starts making a list and the parents have to listen and sort of grit their teeth. Oh, yeah, I want to walk home from school. I'd love to do that. You know, my friends all do that. I don't do it. I'm 10. You know, I want to take the Long Island Railroad. I want to do one kid wanted to sell bracelets at school. These were quirky things. One kid wanted to take a, a local bus, et cetera. One kid wanted to play chess with the guys in the park. <laughs> I guess that's fine as long as you don't bet a lot of money because you're going to lose. Um, Anyways, so, so the kid, the, the, you know, he takes, he decides to walk home from school and the mom who herself is so nervous has to take the day off work because she can't stand it. She, she herself is anxious, obviously. And the kid walks home from school and he's fine. And so the next day she can go to work and he's walking home from school. So uh, that was my attempt to keep watching to the, to the actual camera, but now I'm going to go back to looking at you. Um, so he, you, the, the uh, independence therapy involved doing um, one of these independent things that you want to do over the course of four weeks. So they do 10 to 20 things. And um, that was over the summer. And then came the beginning of sixth grade for this particular kid. And the first day of school, this being our era, parents, feel free to bring your child in with you. We know it's a big day. It's a new school, lockers, combinations, homeroom. Who knows? Oh my gosh. Of course they can't handle that. And, and the kid told his parents, he said, I can, I can do this. I got this. And so he went and he's, he goes by himself to the first day of school, which something most of us did, except for you. And, um, and he comes home and, and he tells his parents, you know what? Like I was one of the only kids who didn't have my parents with me because nobody else had broken free. So Camillo and I talk about, is it, is it enough for the parent to see the kid, you know, playing on the front lawn or doing the laundry or scrambling the eggs? Um, it is if it keeps going, but he, he also wants to do an experiment because he believes that if the first thing the kid does is takes the Long Island Railroad, you know, he can't walk upstairs or downstairs in his own house. He takes the Long Island Railroad for 10 miles. 
that is like the wires in your brain are just, you know, does not compute. And Camillo thinks that that might quickly make a new route in your brain, like, like new, I don't know what it's called, like a new network, because the idea that they can't do anything doesn't, doesn't hold any water anymore when he's gone 10 miles by himself on the Long Island Railroad. So I love the idea of dramatic big things. And I like it when kids want to do those. But I'm living in the real world and I celebrate the kids who make a sandwich or take the elevator. I, I can't celebrate the towel folders. Don't, don't tell the people <laughs> I work with. I just can't. But if she did something else, then I would celebrate that. Can we talk a little bit, too, about the psychological impact of raising a generation of kids that think they can't do anything by themselves, which when you think about it is a very counterintuitive proposition in and of itself, because when a child turns 18, I talk about this a lot on Twitter and on the podcast. When a child turns 18, it's like the government waves this magic wand and says, well, your child's an adult now. And society waves the magic wand. It's like, oh, you're an adult. You can you can vote. You can, you know, live on your own. You can drop out of school, do whatever you want. <laughs> right. um, yeah. Besides drink and buy cigarettes. But, you right. know, whatever. Um, but you can. You're, you're fully an adult. You can go anywhere you want. No one can stop you. Mm -hmm. And the day prior, you're still treated as a child so often like kids in high school have to ask for permission to do all sorts of things and obviously there are lines and you know you have to negotiate with your parents and all of these things but if you think of infancy through to early adulthood as being a continuum you would think that with each year you'd be getting closer to being a fully fledged adult and so there should be more adult-like things that you're able to do mm -hmm. and so it's very strange to think that we coddle our children all the way through until they turn 18. And then we expect them to suddenly leap up and sprout <laughs> wings and fly away and be completely yeah. self-sufficient. And many kids don't do that. And, you know, you wonder why if they haven't been, they've never been given the chance to even grasp at their own capacity. But I imagine that there are significant psychological impacts of children not being allowed to do things, developmental impacts. And I could speculate about this, but I would love to hear you talk a little bit about what you think some of the biggest things are, because there's a reason that you're advocating for this. Besides the fact that it's just incorrect to think that kids can't <laughs> do this, there's also something meaningful that is being taken away by preventing yeah. them from doing things on their own and being out in the world. Like there's something that we have lost. It's not just that it's irrational that bothers you it's it's problematic for other reasons can you talk about this a little bit yeah um i think you you made the case just in this intro but i'll i'll take it a little further um happily the aforementioned peter gray he he wrote this fantastic article that's in the journal of pediatrics and you don't get into the journal of pediatrics by being me <laughs> right you have to have uh you know some credentials and a lot of proof uh to get a piece in there and his piece was entitled something like uh, the decline of independence, and he meant over decades, not just since TikTok, not just since COVID, the decline of independence, basically since the 50s, um, and the rise of mental illness among young people. And by that, he meant uh, anxiety and depression. And I would add passivity. And so, you know, the idea that you're keeping your kids safe uh, from these wildly overinflated dangers like kidnapping. Um, and yet there's real proof with real numbers that are significant of this increase in stuff that we don't want our kids to go through, you know, the anxiety or depression or the failure to launch or whatever. So I'd say it's obvious that the real world impact of too little independence and free play is too much, you know, anxiety and depression. And, and there's another person studying this from a slightly different angle. Her name is Yulia Chentsova. She's a professor at Georgetown of, I always forget if it's sociology or psychology or anthropology, but she's a professor <laughs> at Georgetown. And, and her working thesis, uh, maybe because she grew up in Russia and dealt with like, you know, drunks and bears, whatever she grew up with. Um, she, she says that basically between the ages of seven and 12 is when mother nature slash Darwin slash child development expected kids to be doing all sorts of things on their own, you know, uh, climbing, exploring, playing, arguing, feeling betrayed, you know, feeling scared or getting lost, all these things. 
And each one of these experiences on their own, just having to do stuff and figure things out on their own, knits another like synapse of self-sufficiency. And also when you're out in the world, you're getting a sense of, we call it street smarts. You don't call it indoor smarts, right? So you're on the street and you're getting some street smarts of like, oh, that guy's sketchy. Like, like why was everybody getting on the one subway car uh, yesterday night instead of the other subway car? Well, because obviously there's something rotten going on in the bad subway car. So you know, like, I'm not, oh, look, nobody's getting on the subway car. I will. You learn, you get on the other subway car. So she feels that um, when you don't get enough independence and a chance to figure all this stuff out on your own, um, deal with some sketchy people or some confusion, or you slip on, you know, slip on the sidewalk or whatever, and you realize I can get up again and limp home. I'm not dead. And, and if you don't get this, and and you start getting your freedom much later, um, there's a bad impact. And I'll tell you the the study that she did, and then I'll tell you the impact, which is that um, they interviewed students in. Turkey and Russia, which they considered sort of the opposite of Canada and America. And they asked kids, you're you're nodding, maybe you know this study. They they asked the young people to describe a a dangerous situation or a risky situation. And the Russians all said, oh, you're on the street and there's a drunk guy coming after you. You have to get out of his way. And I don't know what the Turks said, but it was something else dramatic. And then the Americans said, like, taking an Uber (laughs) or being in a cafe. (laughs) <laughs> by myself. So so her theory is that if you don't get a chance to calibrate your riskometer in the real world because you're told that everything is too dangerous and too much for you and you must have supervision because otherwise something terrible could happen or would happen, um, you have a, a faulty sense of risk as indicated by the 18-year-olds who are scared to be in a cafe. And she said, it's not like all is lost. But it's sort of like learning a language late. You know, you learn it between 7 and 12, and you can speak it fluently without an accent. You learn it at 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, later, and you're not as fluid. And it's, it's, it never comes quite as naturally. And that's her theory about risk perception. Now, if you, you know, you want to be pretty good at risk perception. I'm not saying you shouldn't notice risk or calculate it, you know, or, or ever think about it in any situation. But you don't want to be overestimating it at every juncture. And um, John Haidt, who I told you is one of our co-founders, has a, has a way of describing this really well. He says that um, some things are fragile. Okay, You drop a wine glass, it breaks. And some things are resilient, which we want. Uh, like a ball, you drop it and it bounces back up and it's neither better nor worse. But some things are anti-fragile. And anti-fragile is an idea that they actually need some tension or some problem to get stronger. And one of these is our immune system, right? It has to fight some, fight off some diseases and germs for those, you know, red blood cells or whatever, white blood cells. Some blood cells have to learn how to fight, right? And they do that by encountering some germs. And um, stronger people than me know that when you're, you know, weight-bearing exercise, you're supposed to be pushing against something and by, by the bone pushing against something heavy, it gets stronger. And he says the ultimate in anti-fragile systems is a child. And if you only have the good stuff, the birthday parties, the love, the joy, the, you know, the, the, the SUV with an interesting video on in the back or an iPad to Peppa Pig, whatever it is, if you only have that, you're getting all the good stuff, but you're not getting the, um, the woof to the, to the warp. You're not getting um, the other half of the equation that makes you anti-fragile. And Peter Gray talks about this too. He said, every child, you know, comes as a, as a, a, you know, as a, as a, I don't know, a blank slate or a a thing of clay ready to be um, formed by so many different experiences, many of them good and some of them not dramatically terrible, but still frustrating or boring or unfair or betrayed or um, confusing because that gets you ready for life. And so when you're asking what's the problem, if we're just protecting kids from everything, that's the problem. I also feel like even if the child doesn't have an innate fear of specific things, like they're afraid of going to the cafe because a stranger might talk to them, there's also just innate lack of, innate's the wrong word, but this sort of ingrained, ingrained lack of yeah. trust in their own capability. Even if they're not afraid of something specific, right. they still don't trust themselves. Yeah. 
to do something outside of their comfort zone. Right. Because they've never tried. And that's such a that was such a formative part of my own childhood was doing things again and again that pushed my limits. And I think really established early on my own sense of capability in the world and my own excitement around taking risks because I wanted to see if I could do the thing instead of being afraid of it. And it makes me very sad to think of children not ever getting the chance to feel that because it was so formative to so many of us who were raised in ways where we were allowed to do things that looked a little scary sometimes. But I want to come back to the original question that we we started on about how did we get here? Because I still find the progression of this so interesting. Yeah. Like when you were growing up, yeah. you were allowed to go places by yourself. And somewhere along the way, it became it. normal for a child to be outside and a neighbor to see them and to call child protective services. And that sounds melodramatic. And you know better than anyone that it is true. I have watched this happen to friends. I've had a friend leave their kid at the pool in an apartment complex and go back to their apartment to get something. And a neighbor brought the kid back and was like, I called the police and the police are coming. Wow. What's, um, can you tell me what state that's in? Because, you know, we try to get our laws passed. Texas. Oh, Texas already passed our law. OK, interesting. Wow. Yeah, this was a couple years ago. Mm. Um, I'm sorry. That but happened. I was horrified right. when I heard that because I'm from Pennsylvania. I now live in Texas. I thought this was probably going to be a pretty good place to raise kids. And all of a sudden I'm like, wait a second, I maybe maybe I need to rethink this. Um, not actually. I still think Texas is pretty great. But it was it was appalling that this is a thing that could happen because like this was not I feel like even, I don't know, two decades ago when I was a small kid like this didn't this wasn't a thing that people right. talked about that much. And maybe it was happening and I just was blissfully unaware. But like somewhere along the way, it became normal for people to say, I see an unattended kid. I'm going to call the cops. I'm going to call Child Protective Services. Something dangerous is going on. And if I'm not heroic and calling heroic, someone yep. to help, this child is going to die. And I don't understand fully how we got there has it just been this slow frog in a pot of boiling water where just like slowly this change happened or have there been like i've heard you talk about you know the news cycle and the crime true crime tv that have accelerated mm -hmm. like it, it exacerbated people's innate fear that something terrible might happen to a child mm -hmm. but there must be mile markers along the way like yeah. pivotal yeah. events that have happened yep. like how how did we get here uh, uh, well, if you read Free Range Kids, uh, that's really what I, you know, no, I feel bad because Free Range Kids is more of a study of that than than any kind of parenting book. Yeah. And people are like, where are the parenting tips? I'm like, I don't believe in parenting tips. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I'll whip you through the reasons, but then I'll talk about what we talked about at the beginning, um, which I think is the answer. So, yeah. yes, the media, the media cycle is big. The What happened in the 80s is a bunch of things happened at once. Uh, it was the birth of cable TV, which meant a 24-hour news cycle. We'd never had that before. Suddenly, you have bad stories coming at you 24 hours a day. Believe it or not, that didn't used to be the case. You had the news at night. That was it. So um, it's the, in the 80s, also, two other things happened. Uh, one is the broadcasting code changed. And until then, it was set in the 20s for radio, which is, you know, nothing gory. You can't mention, you can't. I guess it wasn't radio, but you couldn't show a pregnant woman. You couldn't show a toilet flushing. It was just a very um, Victorian idea of what was proper to show people. And then they changed the code. And as my friend, the, his, the television historian, uh, Robert Thompson said, there's not even an episode of Law and Order that could have been shown before the 80s. Had it been invented, it couldn't have been invented because they couldn't have shown it because the things, the, the, everything you see on there is too graphic and the, the, the crimes are too horrific. So you have the changing of the code, you have the development of cable television, and you have the um, abduction of Adam Walsh, who was taken um, from, people think it's inside of Sears, it's outside of Sears in Florida and killed. And when there was a miniseries, a two-night miniseries done on the, his abduction and murder, which is just too horrible to think about, it broke all ratings records. And we talked about this earlier, television isn't there to, you know, to inform you or teach you. It's there to um, keep you watching and to get as many viewers as possible. And when people hear that this broke all ratings records, what did? Oh, there's a kid who was abducted by a stranger. Get me more. I mean, that that became the rallying cry. And so suddenly you had not only, um, you know, the birth of Law and Order and all these really scary crime shows, but you also had the children's pictures put on milk cartons 
because John Walsh then became the head of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which pushed for these. And the um, the problem with the the milk carton missing kids is that, you know, we all want to find missing kids, but it didn't explain that the vast majority of these kids were taken in a custodial dispute between two parents. You know, you said you were going to have them back. Well, ha ha ha, I'm taking them to Mexico. Or they were runaways. And so it felt like you had this parade of children who were being kidnapped. I, I didn't realize it. I was talking to somebody recently who said the pictures were even on the milk cartons at school, like the tiny little milk cartons. And I didn't know that, but maybe they were. In any event, they were certainly on the milk cartons that you you know you bought at the grocery and brought home. So between cable and new codes and milk carton kids and the birth of the phrase stranger danger, which I wish I'd invented that one, <laughs> you know, that's a bigger one, right? That's, that's had a, a longer shelf life. Um, stranger danger just became something that seemed wise. And in fact, it's actually pointing you in the wrong direction. If you want to keep your kids safe, teach them, you know, to, to be on the lookout for anybody who there's the three R's, uh, recognize that nobody can touch you where your bathing suit covers, resist, which is run, kick, scream, you know, hit them in the nuts, whatever you have to do if somebody's bothering you. And then report, tell me, even if the person said, don't tell me or that they're going to hurt you or me, just tell me and nothing bad will happen to you. I won't be mad at you. Those three things are going to keep your kid, those three R's, a, f- a whole lot safer than saying, never talk to a stranger. Because first of all, kids don't even know who's a stranger, you know, is the lady at the grocery a stranger or not? So. So stranger danger just became, uh, you know, took on a life of its own. And between the idea that their kids were always being, you know, kidnapped by strangers and being warned about stranger danger, it just became untenable to let your kids go outside. And then there's a couple other things. We, a litigious society, you start thinking like a lawyer, you know, is this safe enough? And an expert society is always coming up with new hoops for you to jump through to prove that you're a good enough parent, you know, get rid of this and make sure this is pure and don't feed your kid a you know, a peanut till they're 22 and don't give them, you know, any non-organic grape without peeling it first and then washing it. And then I guess the middle, it just, there's just a lot of advice. And the more persnickety, I guess, the more it's sold, or maybe there was only persnickety left advice left to give after you said, use seat belts and, you know, fluoride. And then, um, and then the marketplace comes along and the easiest dollar to get from any human being is the dollar from a worried parent. And you have smaller families and two incomes. So that's a lot of income for each kid. And so the marketplace just explodes with all things that you don't need. So that it has to convince you you do need them. And suddenly you have spoons that change color if the food is too hot and uh, baby knee pads and just things that you never needed before. But I think the biggest change is this, is this rampant idea that if you pay enough attention, you can prevent any danger or difficulty. So there's there's that control idea. And then the flip side is your child is not only in constant danger, your child is very fragile, right? One, one mean word from a friend, you know, one fight, one bad grade, one bad teacher. Um, I, I'm not saying that those things aren't significant in the life of a kid, but I'm also saying that those things are not uncommon. And somehow, until now, we expected kids to deal with them um, unless they got really horrible, you know, a really abusive teacher or a bully. That's a different story. But thinking that the best way to keep kids safe and happy is to be constantly scanning the horizon for any uh, blip of a danger or a discomfort and immediately ameliorating it is what's new. I also, I find it very interesting that you know, you start with this phenomenon of the media realizing that they could get the great ratings from promoting stories about children being abducted. And then you get this secondary and tertiary effect of suddenly there's a generation of kids being raised a couple decades later that have a wash of mental health issues because they're not allowed to take risks and develop their own confidence and self-esteem, which begs the question, you know, what are what are the downstream effects of ri- raising a generation of kids who are too afraid to take risks or even aren't necessarily inherently afraid of them themselves, but they just think it's out of bounds and they're not allowed? Or they just haven't had the experience, right? I mean, mm-hmm. um, I think we go back to Peter's study there where, you know, there's anxiety and depression. Um, what did I write? Taking vitamins out of life was my note to myself. 
Oh, yeah. So what you're asking is, you know, you raise a generation of kids and you're not taking literally the vitamins out of their life, but you're taking these other building blocks out of their life, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the the sleepovers or the getting lost or, um, you know, Parents Magazine, which I use as my favorite whipping boy, once had an article on if, if you're kid is old enough to stay home alone and does often, but now she has a friend over, can you go to the dry cleaner? And they said, no, because what if there's a spat, you want to be able to jump in. So the parents, this is why I don't blame parents. I blame parents magazine, but not parents, comma, humans, because they've been fed this steady diet of you better be there all the time. Your kids can't handle anything. If, if you're thinking like, well, what if I have two kids? Am I supposed to be listening to both of them if they're having an argument with their friends? I mean, it, it's a level of supervision and intervention that is impossible and also wrong. Um, the, and what you're being told, though, or what you were being told by that particular article, and many like it, is that if you pay more attention, if you're closer, nothing bad will happen. And if anything bad does happen or even you know, threatens to happen, you better jump in. And then you're leaving your kids defenseless because just like we talked about the immune system, they've had nothing to, to become anti-fragile against, right? They didn't realize like, wow, we had a big argument and then we realized we can both play, you know, you could be one leg of Barbie and I'll be the other leg, you know? I mean, they'll come up with some wacky way to solve a problem, but not if we're solving them first. Lenore, if people want to know more about what you're doing? Where would you send them next? You mentioned- I would send them down a dark alley, right? With, <laughs> with wolves at one end, right? And syphilis at the other, right? <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. I'd say they should come to letgrow.org. And people get that name wrong because it's a hard name. So it's L-E-T-G-R-O-W.org. And on there, we have our you know, we have, I was talking earlier about the Let Grow experience, which is kids being given the homework assignment to go home and do something new on their own. That's there. It's free. We also suggest that schools and homeschoolers um, gather together and, and let kids have free time playing with each other with loose parts, but without us intervening. Um, we're not going to solve the spats. We're not going to organize the games. We're just there if there's an emergency. One person, not every parent. Um, so there's, you know, there's like, what do we call them? Implementation guides uh, for all that there. And there's also things for individual parents. You can take the Pledge of Independence and we send you 10 ideas, like one a week for, you know, let your kid do this or that, but I can't even remember what they are. Um, you know, just little suggestions. And um, also on Facebook, we have a group called Raising Independent Kids. And actually I was, I missed it because I'm talking to you, but I was going to get up a, a blog post today based on one of the questions there, which was a mom writing in saying uh, she, her husband, and their two kids are going to, I can't remember, Colorado for a wedding, but the wedding is child-free. So for the night of the wedding, she was wondering, could she let her kids stay alone in their hotel room? And the kids are nine and 12. And I thought, why are you even asking? But there was a very lively discussion on the Raising Independent Kids Facebook page of a hundred and something answers, uh, really uh, across the gamut, which is interesting because they came to raising independent kids and they're still, somebody said, yes, they could stay in, but don't let them go to the ice machine. I'm like, yeah, uh, frostbite, <laughs> you know, it just, it's just people really are um, conditioned to think in terms of what we were calling, uh, what I call sometimes the worst first thinking, you know, you're always supposed to like, you're almost smarter and kinder and better and more evolved, the, the, the more uh, outlandish uh, uh, a danger you can come up with, because I bet you didn't think about that, did you? You know, the ice machine, like all those people who hang around the ice machine waiting for children nine to 12 to come get ice. But what am I saying? Come to, come to letgrow.org, come to our Raising Independent Kids page. Um, Free Range Kids is the book. And uh, Tell me your stories because it's anecdotes that give me hope, right? I was afraid to do this, but then we did this. I was so proud. Those things for, you know, you might think I get tired of them because I just said it in a sing-song voice, <laughs> but I don't. They, they help me go on because it's the, the nine-year-old rode the subway is 25. And I just need to know that it's not just all going in the, you know, kids are getting less independence more anxious. I have to know that there's hope. I fully expected this to be a great conversation, but this has been 
even better than I hoped it was going to be. This has been so much fun. Oh, Lenora, good. thank you so much for taking the time to, the, to do this. Well, this is what I live to do. <laughs> so thank you for having me on, Hannah. Oh, my absolute pleasure. All right, that's a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for being here. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, please leave a five-star rating. Ratings are how this show gets discovered by other people and it helps me bring in better guests. And no matter where you're listening, please like and subscribe to the show to make sure you don't miss a future episode. That's all for this week. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you next week.